Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Stefan Sisko, and I'll be your host for TechTown Detroit's first incubator demo day. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you for your support of entrepreneurship in Detroit. We're glad you're here. The six company founders you'll be meeting tonight have made it through a long and grueling program in which they've been challenged to take every aspect of their business to the next level and to prepare themselves for the formidable task of seeking investment funding. Tonight, you'll get to see the results of those efforts. And I think you'll be impressed. I'd like to start by thanking the remarkable team behind creating and delivering this program. Dr. Marlo Rencher, TechTown's Director of Technology-Based Programs, headed up the effort. Rachel Allen, serial entrepreneur, COO of the Mary Grove Conservancy and recent Cranes 40 Under 40 honoree, served as lead facilitator. Me, Stefan Sisko, I led sessions in the back half of the program and I helped our entrepreneurs prepare for tonight's demo day pitch. And Dawn Batts, capital strategist for TechTown, led sessions on raising capital. Throughout the program, the founders were supported by exceptionally talented and experienced entrepreneurs in residence. Fatih Abdul Salam, serial entrepreneur, engineer, economist, professor, writer, passionate about developing scalable solutions that have substantial social and economic impact. Jeff Ponders II, serial entrepreneur, marketer, keynote speaker, professional jazz musician, and modern day Batman. David Weber, who has spent over 18 years co-founding companies such as StockX and UpTube and creating critical software applications for businesses of all sizes. And a special thank you to Miles Morgan, life coach at Mind Blown Life for providing a ton of group coaching for all the participants throughout the program. I'd also like to thank the seven members of the New Enterprise Forum who volunteered their time and expertise on a Saturday afternoon to provide a robust pitch coaching session to our entrepreneurs. The 34 years of experience and expertise found in this all volunteer organization is truly remarkable. Now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Marlo Rencher, TechTown's Director of Technology-Based Programs to tell you a little bit about the incubator program. Marlo. Thank you, Stefan. I'm so happy that you all are here. Um, you know, it's really been a hard year. Some people have lost their jobs, some even lost loved ones. And we've all lost a sense of normalcy in our lives. So now more than ever, we really need to rebuild with a sense of resilience and a sense of hope. That's why I'm so proud to introduce this inaugural cohort of the Tech Town Incubator Program. You know, we designed it before the pandemic hit to be a really uncommon program. You'll hear pitches tonight, but the work that these entrepreneurs have been doing has been the hard, boring, unsexy work of becoming tougher, of going from startup to small businesses. These founders have created systems, processes, and infrastructure for their businesses. They themselves have become tougher through personal coaching that we provided as part of the program. They've each had their ups and their downs like we all have, and they've come through this hard time with resilience and with hope. I wanna give a special thanks to the village, to Rachel, to Stefan, to Dawn, to Micah Burley, to Miles Morgan, to Jeff, Fatih, and Dave, to the New Enterprise Forum and the Michigan Small Business Development Center. Thanks to TechTown's community of volunteers, alumni, individual donors, and all those stakeholders who are working with us to help Detroit's entrepreneurs through unprecedented challenges. Thanks so much to this audience for watching and supporting this newest cohort of founders. And thanks so much to Michelle DiMercurio for managing this wonderful event. I also wanna uh, thank tech program funders, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the New Economy Initiative, and the William Davidson Foundation. Danielle, Neil, Greg, John, 
Justin and Michael, we celebrate your effort and we look forward to continuing to support your success. Thank you. Thanks, Marlo. It's time to get down to business. Next, you're going to be seeing eight minute pitches from each of our six incubator entrepreneurs. Each of them is going to be introduced with a short video created by their EIR, the one who worked with them throughout the program. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy listening to these dedicated entrepreneurs as they tell you about their startup. Let's get started. Danielle Parker with Clean Break, formerly known as Detroit Mate. Danielle has been a friend for a long time and to see how she's leveraged the incubator process to transition her service-based business into a developing tech platform has been remarkable. And on top of that, navigating the challenges of the pandemic and keeping the business not only surviving, but thriving, while also bringing a whole brand new life into the world. Um, Danielle is a, is a remarkable human, certainly a remarkable entrepreneur. And I'm excited for you guys to hear about what's happening with Detroit Made and Clean Break. I cannot do everything. I cannot do everything. You've either said it or you've heard it. If you've said it, chances are you don't wanna waste time vetting and searching for cleaning services. Now I set out, I set out to start Detroit Made in 2013. Just gonna, looks like the screen share is stuck. So I set out in 2013, we started as a traditional cleaning service. My commute, my daily commute to work was about three hours a day. And the last thing I wanted to do was clean. And even less, I had even less time to actually vet and source cleaners. We realized that if that was a problem for me, it was probably a problem for other people. And we started Detroit Made. It wasn't too long after that we realized that Detroit Made was not just a, a traditional cleaning service. This is a tech company. And it's a tech company and we recognize that there's two sides to this problem. So the busy professionals who don't have time to clean, for every one of those, they're cleaners who are independent cleaners who are making ends meet to fill in the gap along with raising families and going to school and having other jobs. They want to do those cleaning jobs, but they haven't found the people. They can't generate the leads. So we bridge that gap with our solution. So we did about 300 customer discovery interviews. And based on that, we realized that folks want on-demand service. They want quality service. So we composed a network of vetted and independent cleaners that would allow people to get that service in a really quick and succinct way. And we really know, we know that this sets us apart. Our research indicates that the the two-way rating system and the instant booking allow that ease of use that, our, that all of the customers that we've surveyed have said that they desperately need it. And we believe that that, dis, that differentiator is critically important to the growth. Now, since 2010, folks have outsourced a ton. Now, urban millennials alone have increased outsourcing to home services, chore services, and cleaning services um, almost double in the last 10 years. So with a total addressable market of 250, urban millennial professionals take up more than half of that. And our beachhead is just over 11%. And so the way that it works with Detroit Made is we provide monthly subscription services. Clients subscribe to the service by booking their appointment. They have the option to become a subscriber. They never have to touch it again. They receive monthly service. The independent cleaner goes out to provide the service. They're paid by Detroit Made. We receive a subscription fee. We take 20% uh, of the subscription fee and the remainder goes to the cleaner, the independent cleaner. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about our go to market. So um, in our launch phase, we've been fortunate to receive some good press. We've been in Good Morning America, Better Homes and Gardens, and a few home, um, home services and home goods publications. We recognize that what is working in the launch phase needs to transition as we scale. So we're making efforts to focus more on targeted advertising and marketing as we scale and grow. I'm going to show you the heat map. So that pink area that you're looking at right now, that's where we are. Now, when you take a look over to the right, when you look at the Northeast, that's phase one. So phase one in the navy blue um, is what we anticipate, um, what we tend to just jump right into after our raise, our first raise. If you look over to your left, the teal, um, that's phase two, which we intend to start um, in 2022. And then that'll put us in the best position to be able to, to scale even larger with phase three in 2023, that yellow shaded area. And one thing that we noticed with our research, we've done um, a second phase of research in partnership with University of Michigan, working from home isn't going anywhere. And we see the value in capitalizing on that through partnerships. Employers are looking for unique ways to be able to provide services, um, cleaning as a benefit. So um, we've tested this with University of Michigan and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and we really intend to move those partnerships forward with some of the people that you see listed on this go-to-market slide. So with, with regard to customer discovery, that really helped us to shift our focus to more on demand in 2019 um, and pivot to be more focused in the tech space. Our next raise is gonna be February of 2021. We intend to raise um, 300 in order to build out the, the platform um, and then jump right into launching uh, phase one, um, which we hope to complete uh, by mid-year of 2020. We hope to complete that phase one of the launch or begin, my apologies, begin phase one of the launch in May of 2021. We've got a really great team composed and really poised to grow and scale strategically. They're all serial entrepreneurs who are focused on growth um, and marketing lean, uh, scaling lean and marketing well. Our financial projections are ambitious. So in 2021, uh, we expect that we'll be just over a million um, uh, with phase one. Um, we intend to bring that to um, just under 15 million by 2023. And by 2025, um, we intend to, uh, to have 26 million in revenue um, for 2025. Now our funding requirements, about 85% um, of our first raise is gonna go to marketing and product development. There's a small percentage of that that's gonna go towards legal and staffing and rolled into that marketing component will be um, a bit of staffing and ensuring that we have as strategic a marketing plan as possible and implementing that throughout phases one and two. We've got our sights set on two really key um, possible acquisitions. ANGI Home Services, their most recent acquisition was uh, Angie's List at about 100, at 800 million um, uh, re most recently. NASPERS Foundry is a South African company who most recently acquired um, Sweep South, um, which is a large home services and chore services company based out of Johannesburg. And they have their sights set on um, acquisitions in the US and they really are prioritizing cleaning and home services. So we expect um, to be prepared for an exit in 2025. So I'm really excited to tell you more about our process, more about our progress, um, and any questions that you might have, I'm happy to entertain them during um, the breakout session. So thank you so much for your time. And I can always answer questions right now as well. <laughs> awesome presentation. Oops. That was awesome, Danielle. Thank you very much. Now we're getting ready to queue up the next introduction. And here we go. Uh, okay. 
insights and solutions. I've gotten to know Neil and his team really well over the past several months. I'm really excited about what they've built. I think what I'm most excited about, though, is how Neil has taken a complicated package of that solution and has turned it into a marketable technological solution. Here's Neil to tell you the story. All right. Um, so employers in the U.S. spend five trillion dollars on talent each year, but a lot of these dollars go to waste due to bad talent decisions, starting with hiring. So Hexian is an HR software company that helps recruiting teams make smarter hiring decisions by providing them with real time insight into their candidates job related skills. The problem we're solving is that hiring is really hard both for employers and job seekers. The purpose of the hiring process for employers is to gather information um, to learn about candidate skills um, and make a decision about their ability to do the job. The efficacy of that decision is directly influenced by the efficacy of the information used to make it, right? If you use bad information, you're gonna make bad hiring decisions. And this is problematic because traditional screening methods like resumes and credentials give you very little certainty about a candidate's ability to do the job, primarily because they tend to be incredibly subjective, which amplifies bias. Mm. And they also provide very little information about a candidate's actual skills, right? The resume is, is not the person. And this ultimately makes hiring decisions a guessing game. And this is why up to 50% of new hires fail within 18 months. And 95% of employers admit to making bad hiring decisions each year. And this manifests into really specific pain points for recruiting teams, right? You have poor new hire performance from people who look good on paper, but can't actually do the job. You have high turnover from candidates who seem like a match, but end up leaving within months. And then you have wasted time, energy, and money from recruiting teams that are spread thin on overly repetitive and manual tasks. Now, this is a really big problem because companies spend most of their money on talent sometimes representing over 90% of their expenses. So when you combine this much spend with a large chance of being wrong, the cost involved in doing so is excruciatingly high, right? In turnover costs alone, employers in the U.S. collectively lose over $1 trillion every single year, 80% of which can be attributed to poor hiring decisions. And this doesn't include any of the costs associated with poor performance, and low productivity. So to solve this, we've built a pre-employment assessment platform that makes hiring about skills, not status. Our product is essentially a core operating system for recruiting teams to oversee their end-to-end -end candidate screening and evaluation process. Within the application, you can create and deploy customizable job-specific assessments for technical and functional skills. You can distribute uh, assessments remotely for various professional roles, ranging from software development to sales to marketing and, and beyond that. And then ultimately, you can use our modern reporting platform with dashboards and performance reports to compare candidates, reduce bias, and hire better people faster. What makes this really special is our job simulation-based uh, approach to assessments which replicates real world job tasks and work situations within the assessment and ask candidates to complete those tasks and respond to those situations. So imagine being able to see who can actually do the job before you hire them, rather than just scanning hundreds of undifferentiated resumes and doing dozens of phone screens and interviews with unqualified candidates. As far as the competitive landscape, um, the fundamental problem in talent acquisition is the matching problem. Right. How do you connect talented people looking for jobs with organizations looking for talented people? That's the problem that most companies in this space are trying to solve in a bunch of different ways. Right? So you have cognitive ability tests, you have video interviews, and then you have your sort of ever dreaded personality tests. Right? And sort of the underlying theme and the key gap in the market is that none of these evaluation methods tell you about actual skills, right? Who can actually 
do the job. And that's what we do. As far as the market, more than 40% of the US workforce changes jobs every single year. So think about that, right? Every time someone changes a job, they have to go through the talent acquisition process, creating a $250 billion market for recruitment and staffing. There's a $50 billion market for, core, for the core HR software businesses, and then $8 billion of that is dedicated solely on recruitment software. So there's really a lot of space to work here. <clears throat> Our product is designed to help companies of all sizes face their hiring challenges, from fast growing startups with an HR team of one to large enterprise companies with a fully established HR organization. Our revenue model is subscription based and based on hiring volumes. So a company hiring a thousand people a year is gonna pay more than a company hiring 10 people a year. Our target market uh, or our target customer is mid-size growth focused technology companies that hire over 75 people a year. And given that we're a B2B product, we plan to reach these customers primarily through direct sales channels. In addition to that, uh, we hope to establish you know, strategic partnerships with other HR software vendors um, and HR mm -hmm. consultants, as well as position ourselves as a leader in the recruitment space through content marketing and social media. As far as our traction, we've developed our product, we've conducted a lot of customer discovery, and we've gotten our solution in the hands of customers with testing and feedback. In the coming months, our aim is to focus on customer growth with brand and business development through some of the channels that I mentioned before. Uh, we have a tight and interdisciplinary core team with a shared passion for the problem that we're working on. Problem primarily because we've all faced it ourselves. Uh, we collectively have expertise in the recruitment and selection space, um, and we also have a lot of experience in the software development process, right, from design to implementation. Now, ultimately, our aim is to help organizations build a more diverse and capable workforce through smarter hiring. A company becomes the people it hires, and the quality of any organization is determined by the quality of talent you have in that organization. We know that you can't build great companies without great talent, and we're building tools to help companies hire great talent. <clears throat> so with that, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I'm um, looking forward to answering any questions later on. Thanks. I want you to meet Greg Chase, founder of Hoop Run. It's been fun getting to know Greg these past few months, especially watching how he's handled the COVID-19 shutdowns of gyms and how he had to work through growing a company that requires open basketball courts and face-to-face -face time of his users. So here's Greg, and I'm excited for you to hear his story. There was a time when a simple task like finding out store hours, store inventory, or when a movie started was not an easy task. In fact, the establishment had to set up information outside their building, put it in yellow pages, or maybe even library trips that the user had to make to find this out. Well, amateur athletics is still in that time. My name is Greg Chase, and I want to introduce you to Hoop Run, where there's always a place to play. Ever since I was six years old, I played basketball. In fact, till I walked on under Izzo at Michigan State, and even to this day, I play in my free time. But one problem has been consistent the entire time. Gym owners have a disconnect between players. The pickup basketball can range from just family and friends to very competitive games and franchise gymnasiums like Pickup USA and Joe Dumars Fieldhouse. But the problems remain the same. Sometimes you show up and there's no one there. 
or there's a league going on and you can't play that day. Or it's just closed unexpectedly, not to mention price fluctuations. Just a lot of things you wish you knew ahead of time. And that's what players need, intel. They need to know what's going on at the gyms and when they can get in. And they need access to know that when they show up, they'll be able to get in. Facilities, on the other hand, need exposure. They need to know that their availability is available to the players that want to get there and assurance that they're getting in front of players who want to pay to play at their facilities. Hoop Run solves this problem. Our community-based mobile application gives players a live database of pickup games. And then it gives gym owners automation to set that up and exposure to get those events in front of those players. We do this through monetizing that transfer of information. That live database of pickup games allows players to review and join at their discretion. And it gives gym owners the option to put their events in front of a user base as well. We also are unique in safety where we can minimize that cash transaction and also securely transfer the data between the player and gym owner. We've also fell into a unique opportunity with COVID-19 and these CDC regulations. We can help allow contactless payments, contact tracing, and even player limitations inside these facilities because these facilities are also underutilized. They're built for basketball and usually used for events that are not basketball. Also our software ergonomics that will allow these players to get into these gyms and pay with the click of a button and allow gym owners to set up this entire process through automation. Our competition has not had such a duly motivated solution. See, we provide automation for gym owners, the ability to prepay for players, contactless payments, player and gym databases. The only thing everyone else has seemed to figure out is that we also need to reserve a spot. We'll use this advantage to implement our revenue model, which is our per transaction service fee. Players will pay for these events through our application. We'll take our service fee off the top and forward the remaining to the facilities. In turn, they'll provide us with information about their events and we'll provide that information to the players. Capitalizing on this revenue model will open up other revenue streams, such as highlight tapes, merchandise, and subscriptions, and more. Our market right now is over 450 million players worldwide. That translates to 5.4 billion in revenue for us. Just statewide, we want a beachhead with 6 million in just the Metro Detroit area with our first iteration of Hoopra. Financially, that'll get us to operating profitably in 2023 with revenue of over 10 million in 2025. Our go to market, we'll do this through our go to market strategy. At launch, we'll approach gym owners with direct sales and capitalize on the contact tracing issues that they have now and the automation that we provide. We'll reach players through semi pro and AAU circuits. This is when a large groups of players gather in one city or town for tournaments that usually last for two to three days. At scale, we'll implement our referral program for both player and gym owner and targeted ads for both player and gym owner. Our traction up to now has created us a wait list of over 250 players. Of those 250 players, we've had a private beta with 80 users who actually joined. Of the 80 users who used it, 50 became paid users who actually played and attended in a run. With that, we were able to get five gyms committed to using Hoop Run at launch. The team right now is me, the solopreneur, um, telecommunications major of Michigan State University with over 10 plus years of successful sales experience. But I wasn't able to do this alone. I've had exceptional help with advisors from Lee Stefan Sisko, Jeff Ponders, David Weber, who you've heard about before, and Justin Dunn of Increased Design. But we're actively looking for a CTO as well to help finish with app development and a CMO to help implement and further our go-to-market strategy. We have secured over 54,000 in non-dilutive funding from NoCap at the moment. We're seeking 400,000 for our key hires, marketing and development. Also industry connections from any sports affiliates in our field or experienced marketing talent that could lead to being our CMO. 
a mobile application that provides unprecedented access to basketball. Now is the time to make a move with Hooprun. Thank you for your time. And my information is on screen for any questions. That was great, Greg. Uh, you might not know this, but Greg and I have quite a bit in common. He was a walk-on at Michigan State and I played JV uh, at a small school, high school in Detroit. So I'd like to think that's pretty close. Uh, <laughs> let's get geared up for our next introduction. Paimon International is an augmented reality game developer that adopts blockchain technology into their products. Their flagship title utilizes emerging AR to drive innovative gameplay and set their game apart from others while capitalizing on the users and potential revenue from blockchain technology and casual mobile game markets. Founder and CEO John Wolf is a seasoned game developer and Japanese market specialist, having lived and worked in Japan and speaks fluent Japanese. Over the course of Incubator, the team has secured strategic partnerships in both Japan and in the U.S. and are looking to launch their beta pilot in Q1 of next year. Please welcome Kaimon. John? On mute. Okay. Okay. All right. So when I was a kid, my mom told me that I need to stop playing video games, that there was no way that I can make a living from them, and that they were really a waste of time. But see, I discovered how they're not a waste of time and how you can actually make money from them. The problem is that Unless you're the top player in the world, can you not make money from video games? But what if you're the individual who's just playing casually video games on the weekend with your friends and you know eating pizza on a Friday night, or you're just casually playing as you go to work? The issue is that safe, accessible game economies do not exist. However, at Kaimon International, we have found how to be able to use emerging financial technologies and put it into our games to make this crazy paradigm shift called play and earn. Through our games, you can make money while playing. We are a mobile video game studio specializing in augmented reality, but also specializing in creating what we call game economies. We're able to create game economies by fusing it into the technology that we have. We use something called blotching technology into our back end. So in our front end, we create our video games. In this case, our flagship title is an augmented reality game that is using an exclusive partnership with uh, a Japanese studio that I have connections with. And we're able to then create a video game economy with blockchain technology. So all the characters that are inside the game, whatever you find, a cute pig or maybe in the future, a dog or maybe a cat, is then able to come out of the game and is in your possession for you to own. And then for you to be on a layer and on, in a marketplace on a platform where you can sell it to other people who are interested in that item. They can then bring it back into the game or they can keep it themselves. But the point is that you're able to make money from this transaction. To fully understand this paradigm shift, we have to look at the entire market. You may play video games and therefore you may have heard of Candy Crush or maybe you know Fortnite. These games have traditional app revenue models in which you do in-app purchases, meaning you buy something in the game. But that in-app purchase is one way. Once you buy the character, you buy the in-game currency, it stays there in the game and that's it. But what's so crazy is that we're able to create game economies where the things that are in the game no longer stay there. They are now yours for you to utilize. This is something only a few game companies have been able to tap into and very few have been able to master, like unlike ourselves that we have been able to. We're able to also take this technology and then also package it, these game economies that we create, these proprietary economies are able to then go to other companies. We can give them to app companies or other video game studios who are looking to liven their product and make a actual external game economy out of it. We have that expertise and that's something that we're able to do. 
So we're not just a video game studio, but we're also creating game economies. And those economies can also be enterprise to other individuals. Mm. The market size currently for mobile games alone is 60 billion in 2019. But the space, the space where I'm talking about right now where game items can be shared between people in these uh, game economies as of this year is at 210 million. And that it becomes our beachhead. But we also happen to be involved in augmented reality and VR, which currently as of this year has a market size of 19 billion. So we have a lot of room for us to be able to grow in terms of our market size and what we're trying to aim for. A revenue model exists from us making video games and then us also making revenue from the video games we make and also the game economies that we make. So the more individuals that take part in our game economy and trade from player A to player B, uh, the more individuals who do that and the more things we have that we can sell to individuals that rather than they can find creates more revenue for us to take a piece of. And that's where we can grow uh, and scale from. We also are able to then give our package, our package our revenue model and package these game, these game economies to other companies, as I mentioned earlier, to company A or company B, we're able to utilize them. So as of right now, we're currently working with a Japanese studio, but we're getting revenue from the game economies that we create. So for the games that we make and for the users that we're trying to have, our, our, our point is that we're trying to solidify our game economies as something that is really robust. So our first set of users, our first 10,000, will come from us working with other blockchain games or rather other individuals who have game economies in the space. We'll also work with other individuals who are blockchain advocates, people who are working in the same space as us, who are trying to get more users to utilize their platform. Then we're going to ag aggressively grow overseas through our exclusive Japanese partnerships onto a specific platform that allows us to access anywhere between 100,000 to well, well over a million users. There's a platform called Line, which operates similar to uh, Facebook's Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp messaging. Then we plan to link on to established publishers like Niantic with Pokemon Go or Rovio with Angry Birds. For, so, so for them to gather, to, to, to use our game economies to improve their products or make games through us. Eventually we intend that these will be individuals who will acquire us. Thus far, our traction it consists of us securing a Japanese partnership and also having a proof of concept. The picks that you saw thus far, the AR game that we've made has already, has already been in the market and we've already made the game economy for that. 88,000 pigs already exist and people love them, they're trading them and they are there for people to you know, utilize. As of Q4, we will have our MVP ready and we'll roll out into the next year. But we've also already had talks with Niantic, which is Pokemon Go. And so as we begin to go into the new year, we'll be able to fully roll out our game economy as well as expand internationally and expand our team. We're intending to be able to make $2 million in transactions by 2022. The team is robust of individuals from all over the game scene. Uh, I myself have been involved in video games for 15 years. Um, the, the interim CTO is a very good friend and a co-founder of his own video game studio and knows anything and everything when it comes to computer science or video game development. Our US advisory helps us with our messaging and also with our team growth. And then our overseas advisors help us with our overseas um, uh, expansion in terms of Japan and also Finland because games like Rovio with Angry Birds or Supercell, which makes Clash of Clans, exist over there. So these partnerships are important and we've secured them already. Our financial projections are as follows, where by 2024, we're looking for roughly $20 million in transactions. This is because we're able to monetize our users very well. Blockchain games allow for more average revenue for daily active users. Mm. Every single time a person plays per day, we're expecting them to actually spend this much. Traditional games cannot access this type of uh, average revenue for daily active user, but we can be uh, ambitious and try to reach these benchmarks. The cost of sales comes with us having to give a handling a, a fee over to, um, to the platform we're working with. And the R&D ends up occurring over just uh, with the uh, team and operating expenses. We're looking for $300,000 from targeted investors, the first being Niantic, because we want them to help us out with our uh, technology, our augmented reality technology. We would use the money to expand our economy and also improve our tech, as, also, as, as well as use on legal and marketing. But we also want other target investors, such as Animoca Brands, and really any of these individuals, because we intend that these people would end up wanting to adapt our company to be able to use our 
game economy to liven up their games or to make other games through us. And this is our exit that we intend to have within about four to five years. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I invite you to be invested in the future of video games through Kaimon International, where the more, the, play, the, the more you play, the more you earn. Our latest demo is available for you to check out. It's uh, for iOS and Android. So let us know if you'd like to try it out. And uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Tech Town, for the last 30 weeks. This has been a really great experience to help me uh, formulate my business in my hometown. Thanks. All right, very nicely done, John. So as we um, get ready to introduce our next presenter, which we are ready, so I'll just be quiet. Justin Somerville is a natural innovator. He believes that there's always a better way to make things and is always looking for that way. Safe Clip was developed from a passion to make the game of football safer. Justin and team noticed very few companies working to develop a product that would reduce impact during a hit. Over the course of a year, the team has been featured in over 129 publications, and during Incubator, they've been steadily expanding their partnerships in Michigan and looking to do so outside of the state. Without further ado, I bring you Mayfield Athletics. Thank you for the introduction, Fafi. 1.7 to 3 million. That's the number of concussions received per year by athletes in the US. Up to 50% of concussions go unreported. So that number would be fluctuating between 4.5 and 6 million per year in the US. If you're in high school, you have a one in five chance of getting a concussion during your playing career. And up to 50% of concussions at the high school level are from a blow to the face. If you look at those two images on this slide, that's Mason Rudolph, a Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback. Last year, he received the exact type of hit that we help alleviate. We are the solution. Our first product to market, which is on the field right now, making a difference is SafeClip. Safe stands for shock absorbing football equipment. SafeClip is patented. We have a utility patent that's fully issued. We also have a utility patent that's pending as well. We've achieved a 35% decrease in impact force in the lab and currently foot Currently, SafeClip is configured for football, but there are multiple growth markets for SafeClip as well, namely hockey and lacrosse, but several other small, smaller growth markets exist as well. Right now, when you get a blow to the face mask, there is nothing to absorb that impact. The hard plastic clips that attach the face mask to the helmet do not move. So all that impact force is going directly into the helmet and the head. Safe clip allows the face mask to move back on impact and reduces translational and rotational force. And if you look at that exploded view of the product, we've applied both design and material applications to make safe clip a very effective product. Competition. We reduce impact by 35%. The existing clips that are in the helmets cannot say that. Both of us attach the face mask to the helmet we have game results. The existing clips do not. Here in Michigan, we have two highest schools that have reported 67% reduction in concussions and 100% reduction in concussions. We're retrofitable to 95% of helmet models currently on the field right now. The OEMs are brand specific. You cannot move those from helmet to helmet. And most importantly, we meet all testing standards and we pass them. Our total market globally is $775 million. Here in the US, our market is 675 million. That would include all applications for a safe clip, football, hockey, lacrosse, and several other smaller growth markets. Our beachhead market is a football market here in the US. We are already making an interest in that market as we speak. Our business model incorporates both B2B and B2C aspects. B2B-wise, we're going to be selling to colleges, universities, high schools, middle schools, youth leagues, pro teams. And the way to reach the powers that be at those places is by going to trade shows. There are multiple trade shows per year in the United States that tailor directly to coaches, athletic directors. You name it, there is multiple shows per year in the United States. And that's where we're going to begin to build the relationships with those people and get our product out to the players that they manage. Reconditioners is also going to be a big aspect of revenue for us as well. Some reconditioners here in the U.S. do upwards of 300,000 
reconditions per year. They'll bring the helmet in, they'll put new pads on it, they'll recoat the face mask, and they'll send it back to the schools. And we, we, we would be offered as an upgrade with the reconditioners. At the B2C level, we're gonna be focusing on a targeted social media campaign targeting moms. I like to say if I was able to get in front of football moms, a million of them today, I would be able to sell a million units of safe clip today. We got to have a mom, a football mom say no. And there's also trade shows at the B2C level as well that tailor directly to mothers and women. So that's an option for us as well. Safe clip sells for $29.99 retail. It costs us $8 to produce that. And that gives us a very healthy 73% margin. These are some of the milestones that we've achieved since I founded the company in May of 2014. We've been pulling in early high school adopters since August of 2018. And we are market ready with the cash influx as of right now. And we are also working on product diversification as well. This is our team, me, you know, I'm the visionary, the innovator, serial entrepreneur. Rich Williams is our back-end operations specialist. I don't think that there's a spreadsheet that he's met that he doesn't like. We're also very happy and proud to count Vanessa as part of our team. She brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in marketing and PR, and the plan would be to bring her on in a larger capacity with resources. I also wanna point out that we have Lomas Brown as part of our advisor board. He's a former Detroit Lions player. He won the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay because you can't do that here in Detroit but we're proud and excited to have him as part of our advisor board. These are our financials going out to 2025. And one thing I wanted to really emphasize as you look at these numbers is the fact that as we scale up, we have the ability to drop our production costs, our manufacturing costs by 50%. To date, we've raised $700,000 from friends and family and friends of friends. That got us through the development and testing process of uh, SafeClip development. Currently, we're seeking to raise $500,000 for customer acquisition and revenue growth. And if you look at that pie chart, the biggest expenditure is for marketing and sales and business development. We are done with development. It's time for revenue. These are some of the potential exit opportunities that are in front of us. All these represent established companies in the industry and space that we're entering into. One example is Adams. They produce pads and other protective equipment. In 2011, Shutt bought a portion of the company. In 2014, they acquired the entire company. Riddell has also been involved in several, several mergers and acquisitions, and some of the deals were in the tens of millions of dollars. These are some images of Safe Clip in action. I started the company in 2014 to make athletes safer. And it's been very exciting to me to start to see that take shape on the field. I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna thank you for allowing me to detail out the potential of Mayfield Athletics and the mission that we have. And I look forward to and welcome any questions that you might have in Q&A. All right, thank you, Justin. Very nicely done. Let's go to the next one. Up next is Michael Holloway with OmniHive. I've had the pleasure. My second son was born. Two years, and I was excited. Was one of my favorite my wife numbers. was Some exhausted. Transformation and the last two years has been phenomenal. I needed a plumber. That he's taken my there. toilet was overflowing to, to bear and bring it to there was chaos in my home. What, what they're going to do, and I'm excited for you to get to hear. So, I called the guy, Michael he said Holloway. he'd be out soon. Great, once uh, a few hours went by, no call. I called him again, no answer. I called him again, straight to voicemail, wasn't going to work out. A few weeks later, I run into him at the church. We discuss what happened. And by now he's already seen my horrible review and wanted to know why. We discuss a little bit longer and everything starts to click for me. He had no communication with what happened on my end. 
and I had no communication what happened on his end. But that lack of communication cost him 33% of his revenue for three weeks. Without knowing that before ever getting a chance to talk to me, he needed to really understand my problem. And so I took the time to try to understand his problem. And talking together, we understood that service business providers have three main problems. Making sure that their customers understand what's going to happen, making sure that their people show up on time and that everyone is in the loop and making sure that the job gets done the way that it was said it should be done. This amounts to a $62 billion loss across the United States. With that happening, we saw an amazing opportunity to solve that problem. And so I introduce OmniHive. We are an AI powered automated solution that helps make sure that everyone knows what will happen with your job, when your service provider will be arriving, and what should happen when they get there. Our technology is proprietary and geared around making sure you understand everything that you need for your job, but everything that's going to happen with your job. Our competitors have amazing tools to help business owners understand what's happening in the back of the office, but nothing that stretches out to the customer so that the customer understands when and where everything is happening. We make sure that the customer understands that as well. Our market size is huge right now with $62 billion of a total addressable market and $5 billion right here in Michigan if we start with just Detroit, $400 million in your backyard of people that you already know can be solved right now with OmniHot. Our business model is equally simple. Your homeowner will use the OmniHot platform. The cleaning service will make sure it gets done. And then they pay us a monthly subscription by facilitating the whole transaction. Our go-to-market strategy is equally simple. We talk to the people that you already know, the, the moms at the football games, the dads at the soccer games, the people that you walk into at church. They're right there and they're also the business owners for these businesses. Our traction has been equally great. Just this May, we started with the Tech Town Incubator. In August, we got accepted into the No Cap Exchange Program, giving us the resources we need to fully launch our service. And today, with your investment, $500,000, we will be able to grow our business month over month by 50%. Our team has the skill necessary to grow, operate, and to scale this business the way that we need to, while our advisors have the knowledge to let us know where we are technically and financially. Our projections say that we will be profitable in just a few short months of scaling and growing patiently. Again, our fundraising of $500,000 of $500, today will be used on marketing, sales, and hiring more tech staff to further grow and scale this platform to what it really needs to be to capture the rest of the United States market. Thank you. That is on me. Thank you, Michael. Very nice job. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to, to all six of tonight's founders and congratulations on digging deep, on making the most out of this strenuous program and for your terrific presentations this evening. Now, if you'd like to have a conversation with any of our Demo Day founders, please visit our event page at the address listed on the screen. 
I hope, because I don't see it. At the address listed on the screen. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to have a conversation with any of them, if you visit the page here, you could click on the founder's tile. It'll open up a window and you can schedule a meeting with them via their Calendly link. And once again, I would like to thank our program funders who make Tech Town's incubator program possible. Michigan Economic Development Corporation, New Economy Initiative, and the William Davidson Foundation. Don't forget, next week, please join a panel of expert judges during our Start Studio Showcase as 10 startup teams share their journey of validating their innovative tech-based business ideas. If you wanna learn the first steps to becoming a startup, or if you just love hearing about the next big thing, this event is for you. Make sure to visit techtowndetroit.org to preview the video presentations and cast your vote for your favorite team for the Start Studio People's Choice Award. The voting is open now and will go until next Wednesday. That's it. Thank you, everybody. We're glad you joined us. Now let's all go out and do something good for entrepreneurship in Detroit every chance we get. Be well, stay safe, and good night. Voting is open now and we'll go until next Wednesday. That's it. Thank you, everybody. We're glad you joined us. Now let's all go out and do 